This is one of those lesser done, lesser known uh, pieces of the canon. Um, and for that reason, when Denise, uh, our artistic director, contacted me, um, I think in January is when she called and said, would you be interested in directing uh, this summer and would you be interested in working on Antony and Cleopatra? I leapt to the chance. I said, yes! And she said, now you don't have to do A and C. Um, if you'd rather work on a different title, is there another play you'd want to work on? And I said, nope, I want to do Antony and Cleopatra because it's not an opportunity that comes around very often. Um, the play is not done uh, as often as some other titles and for a number of reasons, right? Um, the largest reason is that it's not done as often and therefore it's not as well known and therefore it's not as done as often. Um, and unfortunately, if we just did the play more, it would be more well known and it would get done more often. Uh, but there are also some very pragmatic, practical reasons why the play uh, is less often performed. It's very, very large. Um, large both in terms of practical demands. Um, it's not a show that easily is done with a cast of seven or eight. You really wonder how the Chamberlain's men ever did this with 11 or 12 actors. Um, it's not a show that's done on a small budget because you have so many different characters and places and locations to go. It's not done very often because unless you take a radical approach to cutting the script, you're looking at a play that um, in England runs three hours and here runs about four and a half. Um, take a deep breath. Our production runs just over two uh, because we have taken a radical approach to how do you compact this story. Um, it's, it's not done very often. Um, because it's very challenging. It interweaves uh, three or four main narratives and seven or eight little tiny subplots. Uh, it's a piece of epic theater um, th th that's playing on a much larger scope or tapestry even than some of the, uh, the English history plays. Um, it's not done very often because it's convoluted and messy. And thematically, it's not always clear exactly what we're going at. It's not done as often because where we intersect with the play in 2017 is often very different from how uh, 400 years ago we anticipate audiences intersected with this play. It was registered in 1608, probably written in 1606, 1607. Um, and just our relationship to the content or our perceived relationship to it is very, very different. Uh, and it's not done very often because nine times out of ten when it's done here in the States, um, it, uh, uh, it comes with a bit of controversy. Uh, for all of the previous reasons that I've stated. Those of you who uh, may be wondering what you're about to walk into, right? I'd love to frame that by talking to you a little bit about um, how we approached the play, right? Um, when you, when you take one of these things on, you, you always have to figure out, okay, well, what are we saying with this play? What do, what do we want to want our show to be? And uh, on the Venn diagram of history and apocrypha and perception and the script and Shakespeare and what we find palatable, the overlap is it's about that big. Uh, and it gets tricky real quick. So Denise said, well, what would you do with it? And I said, I don't know. And my first pitch was, how about we do something hyper-political? And Denise said, how about we not? Um, and I said, great. And she said, how about it comes in around two hours? And I went, oh. <laughs> oh, okay, right? Um, and so it sent me to a place to thinking about what is this play? How do we, how do we tell this story on this stage uh, within those parameters? What I love about this play, and sort of the root, the, the, the place where I intersected with it and went, that's what we want to do, is that at the core of this thing is this incredible love story, uh, this story of a war, of uh, two titanic empires, right? Uh, populated by titanic people, and about what happens when the unstoppable force meets the immovable object, right? It explores this binary of a, a world that um, values and sets at its forefront passion, free expression, desire, sensuality, emotion, and a world which in its antithesis sets forward uh, stoicism, duty to state, uh, severity, uh, dispassion, um, uh, temperance and coolness, right? Uh, the Shakespearean scholar uh, John Barton talks about um, passion and coolness being the thing that we're always trying to threaten these plays. And what's beautiful about this play is that 
That's our binary. It's about passion and coolness. Great. That's the story we're going to tell. Immediate problem. Uh, though that's what's at its core, the play comes wrapped in a um, number of conceits and um, worldviews that in 1607, can't imagine, Shakespeare's audience blinked. Uh, Denise said to me, can you direct the play and not make it about a dangerous emotional woman? And I said, yeah, it's alarming to me that that's the starting point though, and that's the intersection that so many people come at the play with, right? I, I had, was part of an interview a few months ago, the interviewer, a wonderful person, said, well, I, I know the play. I hate Cleopatra. She's just so emotional and sleazy and disgusting and manipulative and awful. I went, oh, we have our work cut out for us, don't we? Because I don't see Cleopatra that way at all. The play does not textually make a particularly strong argument one way or the other. It lets you choose. What is the right way to live our life? Make no mistake that I believe in 1608, 1609, Shakespeare's audience sided up with one camp in this play. And it was not Cleopatra, <laughs> where I align. So the play comes wrapped in that, and then the play comes wrapped in something even trickier and uglier, which is to tell this story of this binary of passion and coolness. Uh, Shakespeare has essentialized, right, uh, the racial identity of the Romans and the Egyptians, right? Shakespeare has uh, constructed these two worlds out of whole cloth. He's invented them for his own purposes. He's borrowing from Plutarch. He's borrowing a little bit from other sources. But on the whole, he's writing a play of convenience to tell this story. And along the way, something happens. You essentialize the racial identities, the racial identity of these two characters. And as soon as you have that on stage, you run into a real problem because you are claiming that to be Egyptian is to be this, 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 and this, and to be Roman is to be this, 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 and this. And all of us go, uh-oh, how are we gonna navigate this one, right? So I went back to Denise after she said that my grotesquely political version of the show uh, would not meet standards <laughs> of practices, uh, to her credit. And I said, well, I'm, I'm looking at how other people have approached the show. Uh, and drawing on the productions I've been a part of. Some productions choose to ignore, just outright ignore, all the sexism and racism and homophobia, uh, gender normative content, and just pretend it's not there. I don't think that works, because we're smart. And like, we hear stuff and go, wait a minute, did they just say what I thought they said? Uh-oh, and the play doesn't work. Some productions have attempted to uh, reclaim use the show as an act of reclamation. Well, we'll use yeah. it as a play to empower the Egyptian people or to empower the character of Cleopatra. I don't think that works for a couple of reasons, and I don't think it would work for me. I don't think that works because, again, that's not the story at the root. And as soon as you try to bend one of these plays to be about something that the thrust of the narrative is not, a chunk of the play will work, and the rest of the play feels like it's about this other thing. Um, I also, and, and I said to Denise at one point, I am a straight white male. Um, I, I look in the mirror and my privilege is something that I, I, I can't deny. A play about reclamation? I don't have any business doing that. And if he's invented these cultures out of whole cloth, what exactly am I reclaiming? Which, what, what am I reclaiming exactly other than some ambiguous idea? So that doesn't work. Um, and then we said, well, wait a minute. What if we invent the worlds of the play. If Shakespeare has invented Egypt and Rome for the sake of his stage, borrowing from a source here and a preconception there, and they're only really Egypt and Rome in name only, why can't we do the exact same thing? Why can't our Egypt and Rome look like a place out of time, out of space, uh, something that draws on the imagination, that draws on um, semiotics, draws on emotion, draws on subconscious imagery. Why can't we do that and let the binary of passion, dispassion, rest out there? Uh, and that became our approach. Uh, when I began working with our designers and our, you know, doing the dramaturgical work, work and meeting with our company, the very first page of the packet said, uh, this is not a history play. Shakespeare's playing fast and loose with history anyway. Uh, if our play looks anything like a museum, we have failed, and if our play looks anything like what a person off the street thinks Egypt or Rome looks like, we have failed. 
The only way to approach this one is from the ground up, make it up. And whatever people think Antony is, or Cleopatra is, or Caesar is, or Rome is, whatever they think about this story, we're going to do our best to tell a brand new play, a brand new story. Um, my feeling about this production, I guess, <laughs> is that if we dug up Shakespeare and showed him the play, he'd be baffled by the microphones, he'd wonder why the women were up there, uh, he'd be thrilled by the trucks, um, and that... And really, who isn't? And, uh, have you been over there? Um, I, I think thematically we tell the story. I think that the choices we have made lead into that. The other thing is this. Uh, I think that we, in America in particular, um, privilege realism because we've all got a television, we've all seen a bunch of movies, and we're all used to realism, realism, realism. And one of the hills that I will like go out and die on is my fervent belief that these plays are not realism. You know, they're, they destroy any sense of the unities. They're speaking in verse, and when they're not in verse, they're in heightened poetic prose. Um, they're, they're not realism. And so every choice we make is meant to be read as a symbol. Every choice we make is meant to be read as uh, semiotically implying something else. Um, history play it ain't. Because it's...